So uh, many thanks to patients Lori, Lydia, Bonnie, Alyssa, and Christy, um, who have really you know, touched on a wide variety of uh, aspects I think we don't have answers to yet, right? And so I'll, because it's my job, go through what I was able to note down, but I'm sure all of you also have other observations for everybody. And I thought I would do a quick summary, and then I'm not going to pull the panelists or ask them questions. We're going to go right into you raising your hand, and I'll take three questions, and then we'll try to work through those together, and we'll just go on like that until we're tired which is not now. You're not tired now. <laughs> um, so the first thing that comes out for me, and it's no surprise, and I, I rather suspect it might have been designed in this way, um, is, is the, the big strand around the teachers and the teacher professional development. In fact, uh, Dr. Patience, in your presentation, you repeatedly used the words, teachers need to, they need to, they need to. And that's potentially very true. And they also aren't. <laughs> and aren't and aren't, and we've all seen it. So the gap between are not right now and need to is rather enormous, um, and I'm sure it could generate some rich discussion here about how we'd like to engage with that challenge. Um, I would say that it, it reminds me of a lot of discussions we've all been through about how do we have an efficient, effective, simple, scalable response to teacher professional development. <laughs> because we're all very grateful and lucky when we can have $7 million to work in a fairly small number of Rwandan schools, but we also sometimes all find ourselves where we don't have any such thing, and we're trying to make $7 million stretch across 7,000 schools. So what do we do about the teacher professional development challenge? Um, we have an, an ever-present question of materials, right? And I know I myself have worked on many programs where they, you know, I've been through many and I've led many, actually, embarrassingly, last minute nightmare disasters where the copy is due to the printer at noon and we're at 11.59 and we're fixing all the desktop publishing and, oh my God, and it's going to cost $10 per book, but we have to do it because the kid can see. I mean, we're always running behind that materials eight ball in one way or another. <laughs> And um, African Storybook shows us a set of possible responses, but I'm sure there's an even wider universe we could help each other find in order to have, and these adjectives sound wonderful to our Western-trained ears, but they're staggering, right? Apparently, according to this morning's presentations, we need rich, multimodal, layered, multilingual, and potentially digital materials. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we have this whole chapter, right, on policy and practice around language and policy and practice around reading. And these two things connect but are not synonymous. <coughs> and I think in the interstices there, we're going to find ourselves, if we have them, tripping over our feet for a while. Um, <laughs> So questions come up from Dr. Lydia's presentation. What are the best ways to capitalize on the linguistic abilities that the children have when they walk in the door? Right? They're showing up and they're speaking Swahili or they're speaking um, Camaro, uh, but they're not necessarily speaking English. And therefore, and we've all seen it, no matter what the policy in the capital says, the teacher's going to be pulling on his or her vocabulary in those languages because running a classroom is a big task. Um, so, so what do we do to capitalize on the abilities that our children have? That's important. What are teachers' attitudes and beliefs about how that should best be done? What's behind all that and how do we shift it if we need to? Um, what are the specificities of translanguaging in specific subjects? We heard good examples here from science, uh, from math. I suspect translanguaging in reading may be particular in some ways we would need to unpack. Um, I'm sure it would work well for explaining vocabulary and making sure that everyone understands that a chewing stick is something else. <laughs> uh, but if you're going to be decoding and reading text fluently, you as a learner in, engaged in that process can't really be at that time in your life translanguaging. So what's the specific site of translanguaging in the reading classroom? I think would be very interesting to kind of get a handle on. Um, and then are we using these languages, and I think this is the $60 million question, in the upper primary grades, are we going to use children's languages as what the French call the tremplin or the trampoline, or are we going to use them as the medium and actually try to create a world where we have a lot more late exit going on? 
I don't know. You guys get to write me proposals and tell me whether that would work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's important. I, I think we also see in the Rwandan example um, a lot of this sort of hard reality that we've all dealt with for a while, which is you don't really get to skip a lot of the steps in reading instruction. It's not like there's some grandiose on-ramp that gets you quickly past phonics and you get to kind of not do that chapter. <laughs> you don't get that advantage. And therefore, I believe, our discussions around transition are slightly disingenuous and flawed, because I think our transition discussion lives more in the language space than it does in the reading space. The sub-skills of reading don't precisely, handily, nicely transition for us. Something like pre-literacy and an idea that I read text either left to right or right to left or up and down or that this is a book and it has a front and a back, yeah, all that's going to that's gonna transition. That's going to just flip over from working in one language to working in another. But something like phonics, that's the concept that a thing represents a sound will transition, but what sound does this thing I am looking at represent? That doesn't transition. That has to be taught. So I think our discussions around transition might benefit from a little more nuance in the reading space. What else? Or have I said enough? Also coming up in these presentations, other big expectations around policies and norms, right? Curriculum, testing, measurement, standards, expectations. What is the right measurement? How fast and far and at what level of English should a child in Rwanda be able to read at the end of his sixth grade year? I, I know for a fact, I worked there, that the government of Rwanda thinks they know the answer to that question. <laughs> but I'm not sure that the answer that is retained in their documents is very much based on the reality of the learners that we're seeing in your presentations. So lots to work on there. Big questions in the category of sort of systemic response and political economy. Who is benefiting from not having wide, cheap access to the kinds of multi-layered, multimodal books we're looking at here? Who's getting a gain out of not having that available? Why do we persist in the frameworks we persist in in these countries? For whom is the upside and why is it happening? What is the paradigm behind thinking, oh, it's natural that lots of kids should fail grade six? That's what an education system is for, Jacqueline, is to find the dumb ones and weed them out. Right? Lots of big political economy questions behind those questions for the upper primary as we come into the high stakes testing in grade six. I'm going to, with your patience, um, ding the panel a little. Families and communities appeared in Dr. Soa's slides. <laughs> we never got there in the morning. So if you have questions on family and community, bring them on. <laughs> Um, and I think it can all be wrapped up in a couple of comments about how do we really design for these learners, right? They're at a difficult developmental stage. Anyone who's had a prepubescent kid knows that. <laughs> um, they're under a lot of demands and pressures from their family, their environment, their society. Designing for all of them may mean thinking really carefully about the differently abled or the disabled and using universal design for learning, because maybe a rising tide floats all boats. We like to think so. Designing for all of them is sure as heck going to mean dealing with our bottom quintile, which all of us struggle to move forward in any of our project formats, even when we are Dr. Peggy Dubeck, who I'm staring at. <laughs> but getting that bottom quintile moving is hard. Um, and so how are we really going to engage with all of our learners to get them where we want them to be? And then since we're donors and partners together, we're going to find ourselves back in the same struggles of, do we want the rich, beautiful, designs that we know are wonderful and it's a feast for the kid and, and everybody loves it? Or do we need something lean and simple that we can sell at a GPE meeting? I don't know. Uh, do we want to fix and improve what we've got? Take our, our Rwandan primary schools and say, OK, I see a few things that could go better here. Let's fix and improve this. Or do, and I'm being you know, somewhat radical, but do we need to just tear this down to the, to the foundation and start something entirely different for middle school? Because maybe this isn't ever going to fix. I don't know. Uh, do we want to save just one child every time, sort of a la Paul Farmer with Haiti and health? And 
you know, paying Harvard's dollars to put that one kid with tuberculosis on the plane to Boston, because if you can save one life, you've saved the world entire? Or do we need to figure out something that works mostly for all, and maybe not as beautifully as something like this would? I don't know. Um, and then do we want to put our money and our focus into the classroom space, which is what we've heard a lot about here? Uh, or do we need a more systems, holistic approach that's you know, got beautiful graphs and shows how pieces of things connect to other pieces of things and suddenly wonderful change results? I don't know, but I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> so with that, who'd like to uh, jump in? Yeah, Edward. I'll take two of these and we'll get going. So good morning, Edward Winter from World Vision. Um, I'm in... I'm interested in, um, I think you, you teed it up, Rebecca, just about World Vision does a lot of work with commu around community engagement for literacy. And given the challenges around you know, teacher training and large class sizes and extremely content heavy curricula, um, what do you feel is the role of the community in helping to maybe overcome some of the in-school challenges that may, may be insurmountable? Yeah, great. Let's see if we can get one more. In. Uh, Amy Bernath from IREX. Uh, I know in the first presentation from patients, she mentioned that the goals were twofold, sustaining gains and improving learning outcomes. And I would be interested to hear from the panelists, at least for the context where you're working, do you feel like the stagnation in upper primary is more about retention or more about lack of acquisition? and kind of depending on what the answer is, how does that change how we address it? Okay, so two good things to start us off. Uh, role of the community, engaging the community, and then this balance, the sustaining gains. What, how do we really get there from here? So maybe we'll start with community, and I don't know, do you wanna kick that off, Alyssa? Okay, I think, um, thanks. For the question, Edward, I feel like World Vision, I'm answering this, but this, maybe that's not too weird. But it's okay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get other people. We'll get other we'll people get, as well. Everybody um, will get a chance, but, um, and Lydia. No, I think um, <laughs> with the community, um, there's definitely, I mean, I, I, I like what I mean, Patience said um, earlier, just like needing to look past that sort of children come in, you know, at this time in the morning and they leave at, at this time, that we do have the opportunity to um, involve the community much more, um, whether it's, uh, one of the things that comes to mind is just um, local level grassroots kind of um, advocacy. And some of the work we do is looking at um, the community being involved in social accountability. And if one of the matters is that, yes, children are transitioning to um, the language of instruction being, you know, whether it's English or another language, that um, the community sh um, care about that and they can be more involved with, um, at, you know, making ask of local government in terms of more resources, more training, more support um, for teachers. Um, I mean, that's one of the things we struggled with, I think, in the project even before the, the toolkit was um, developed. We were thinking, okay, how are we going to address this um, that teachers don't maybe have enough um, English skills? Um, you know, do we give them English classes? Like, I mean, we had a lot of discussions and then we, you know, we came up with the strategies. But I think... Um, the community can also, um, you know, when you mobilize them, they can make demands about, um, you know, this is the policy, this is what, you know, this, our children are learning English. We need to have, you know, the materials, the resources. So I think that's part of the, um, how the community can be involved. Great. Other thoughts on community? Hi, thank you. Um, Lori Asaf. Um, Part of what I didn't have time to share with you is that through the, my projects, I had two models, one in which we were working directly in the schools and the other model in which we were pulling out and working in summer camps or winter camps, depending on when we were there. So they were three to four weeks of digital summer camps, and we thoroughly involved the community. And um, some ways in which we did this is we invited our secondary grade students um, to come and participate. They were our language mentors 
realtors. We also worked with local teachers. Um, so our model was very heavily um, community focused. Um, and that allowed us to work, we had about 40 students. So we were working in those in smaller groups with multiple levels of support. Now my dream is to have a pipeline to teaching within the community that I work with. And so my ultimate goal is to mentor my secondary students to see themselves as teachers mm -hmm. because they live in the community, they care about the community, they know the children, most siblings and family members. And so I had an all I have an ultimate goal and we're going to continue to do this over the next few years. But um, as well as the kind of the direct involvement of community members, we're using a lot of local texts, right? So not only the digital texts that I mentioned, but reaching out to the community and finding local texts that was utilized, like in a grocery store. There, um, for example, a poster on the board had listings of mobile phone charges and you know buying SIM cards using community-based texts to explore and read and talk about. So those are just a few ideas. Great. We'll do Lydia, and then I know Bonnie has something to come um, in. Um, so what I have is not a response, it's just thinking about the communities that we're addressing here. We're addressing communities, some of them in rural settings where literacy is very low, even in their home languages. And also the distinction between parents' work and teachers' work. And so often those of us who have interacted with parents in the rural communities, you realize that once they've taken their child to school, it is teacher's job. So I think grassroots movements, so, uh, training where teach, uh, parents are taught on what they could do, their roles in assisting or helping their students, supporting them in whichever way is possible would be a good beginning point. Great. And maybe we can hear from Bonnie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You can hear. Okay. Thank you so much. I just, I just wanted to just... Um, notes uh, that, that in many ways the Global Storybooks and African Storybook Project is a family literacy project uh, because um, children can of course read these stories in the home context and parents, even if parents aren't literate, um, they can listen to stories and they can listen to stories um, in the mother tongue and or in English or French or Portuguese or other languages of wider uh, instruction. And, and it was mentioned a number of times that teachers are sometimes feel not very confident about their English skills. And this is again where the audio features of, you know, the Global Storybooks project might be powerful because teachers could play stories in English um, and, and children could hear, you know, the, uh, many stories read in, in English and teachers could possibly improve their own skills by listening to those stories and um, the audio features of those stories. So, you know, just uh, that, that I, I do hope that it seems to be a resource that might be helpful for teachers. Um, I'm just thinking in, in, in Rwanda where there's English and French, the stories are all available in, in both those language. And we're working on now putting them, the Kiru Rwanda we hope will also be, the audio version will be a, available soon. So the connection between home and school can be made very effectively by, by uh, drawing on tech, digital technology. Most, most pe me, parents often do have cell phones. Um, and of course, these resources can be played on cell phones. Uh, and uh, so parents can feel that they're also part of the school community, especially if they go into the school and they see that their languages are represented in the school context, even in a modest way. This helps to build community between a home and school. Great. Thank you. So with that, we can go to Amy's question on sustaining the gains um, and sort of, oh, did you want to come in on that, Christy? Oh, I was, I was gonna say, I didn't okay. That yeah. And uh, so let's start with Christy and then maybe Patience, since you had underscored that in your presentation, maybe you can come in on that as well. So the question was around, uh, is it possibly stagnation, lack of acquisition. Um, and I think the first thing that came to mind for me was really about some of the structural roadblocks that are there, um, especially in the Rwanda context. You have the curriculum um, when they move into fourth grade that is very technical. 
And they don't have the supports built in. The textbook's all in English. They don't have the, the supports built in. Um, I was speaking to some of the teachers there, and they were saying that the, the students would want them to stop all the time and switch to Kinyarwanda to discuss <laughs> that vocabulary word. That time isn't built into the curriculum, but being realistic, it has to be built in, right? So these kind of structural roadblocks around time management with the realities, um, I think this is one area that, um, you know, is critical with that. And then also, too, just thinking about, you know, there's just not that lack of the bilingual books for them to be able to, you know, make the associations between Kinyarwanda and English. So that would be one of the recommendations for that. Great. And I would also like like to add in in addition to that is back to teachers <laughs> but being able to prepare teachers in ways and it's hard here in the west as well to be able to differentiate their instruction to be able to assess children in classes to know what their challenges are and build on that and it's hard it's hard here in in what in the west and it's harder there where you have huge classrooms and it's hard to just get and challenging to to pull students out and to work with them. And in, a lot of times we talk about formative assessment, but formative assessment is supposed to inform our teaching and, and teachers don't know how to do that. And if we can move them towards doing that, then they can adjust their lessons to help the ones uh, who have repeated, because um, I think that was one of your questions, of retention, right, right, and, and, and to move them along. But it's challenging, and I, I can't pretend to have any answers, but there are things I think that we should definitely think about. And is the time enough? Is 30 minutes a day enough? Is 45 minutes a day enough? Um, and so those are all um, issues that we have to think about. Yeah, and, and that gets back to my thinking about do we fix what we've got or do we need to do some stripping down to the bones of the house, right? Because probably not. I'm not standing here with a data set, but past experience might suggest 30 minutes is going to be a little short. <laughs> so what do we do about that? Do we try to make the 30 minutes work or do we really get in there and wrangle with the ministry about how this whole thing is built together? Yeah. Because writing, for example, takes time. And how much can you do in 30 minutes for the younger ones? You know, so. Lucy Calkins would say not much, if that's the model you're thinking you're of. Using, thinking of writer's workshops alone. <laughs> Any other thoughts on sustaining gains before I... No? We're good. Other questions or thoughts? Yes? Who are you and what's your question? Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Rachel Jordan from RTI, but I'm bringing a question from our webcast uh, from two participants for Dr. Norton. So it's really a two-part question. Coming in from the UK, uh, as far as possible, Africa Storybook should try and use indigenous readers from the global story portals. How far are they going to ensure this? And then from Canada, are the English recorded voices easily understood by the children? My experience is that they sometimes have trouble understanding our accents when speaking and listening in English. Great, Bonnie, <laughs> help. Thank you very much. Actually, um, Rachel, could you just repeat the first question? Of course. As far as possible, Africa's storybooks should try and use indigenous readers for their global story portals. How far are they going to ensure this? Mm. Okay, thank you so much. These are excellent suggestions. And um, to have local readers reading um, English, for example, would be excellent. What technology makes this available? Um, what we, one would want is, is volunteers who, who would um, take up that challenge and, um, and do the audio recordings. One of the things that we can do in our, in our projects is to upload those um, readings and, um, and, and make those more widely available. What we don't have here in, in Canada or any, any place in the world would have all the accents available. But technology means makes these accents uh, portable and mobile. So um, the whole concept of the African storybook and also global storybooks 
is what it could be called local stewardship. So anybody in a local context, whether it might be Uganda or Kenya, Liberia, uh, or any other country in the world, can, can download um, the actual countrywide uh, uh, source data and take it over and customize it for their own use and have local African accents or could be other South Asian accents uh, that would be available to children. I think that's a, it's a brilliant idea and very much in the spirits of our project because local stewardship is, is key. And in fact, you know, this does connect with the, the second question which came from Canada, do people understand our accents? Well, the interesting thing, uh, if we just think about English, of course, there are many different um, accents of English. And one of the things that we love to, would love to uh, promote is the idea of world Englishes. Um, and again, it's that notion of local stewardship. If you have a form of English that is spoken in a given country, all it takes is to, uh, to, to read the stories, to record the stories in those local English um, accents and upload those. There's nothing stopping one from having a story that says, you know, British English, American English, um, Indian English, um, Australian English, uh, uh, Brazilian English. That would be absolutely perfect. And that is why the digital is so powerful because uh, you can scale up and you can have different versions of, um, of languages, stories, and so forth. So we invite you... Um, everybody globally to be to join the team um, to take ownership I think ownership was another issue that was raised in in the previous discussions because we we need to work in partnership with one another uh, we have different skills and talents and uh, you know we for example have some of the technology uh, you know available here what we don't have are speakers so right. thank you for those excellent questions and thanks for those great responses. And you can volunteer with Bonnie. I don't know if you heard that. And people you know can do that. <laughs> Please volunteer <laughs> for African Storybook. OK, so let's see if we can get, maybe I'll take three more if we've got them, just so we can try to give everybody who's got a question or a comment a chance to come in. Uh, yeah, Karen. Yeah. Um... I was struck in listening to you all about uh, how you really focused on transition from L1 to L2, but you also, in these grades, are reading across the curriculum. And I was a little bit puzzled by some of the presentations. You were talking about really interesting activities and everything, but I was wondering whether you were focusing on a class dedicated to reading or language arts. And if you weren't, how were you dealing uh, with situations where most often the curriculum is siloed, it's highly structured, it's overcrowded, and there's really limited time? So I was wondering, like with Laurie's examples, mm -hmm. how do you do this is my career? What class do you teach it in? And how do you coordinate across the different subjects that include different teachers? Great. Laurie, don't answer, but hang on to that because I think you'll start off on that one. Let's see if we got a couple more. I love you, Linda, but I'm going to take Joni. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, question actually compliments Karen, strangely. So um, I was struck by all the different approaches and how in the ideal world that all fit together and would be using a pieces of all of them. Um, but I think the things that I kind of perseverated on maybe were Ooh. the issues of the spiral curriculum and then the combination of reading and writing. So it kind of piggybacks with what Karen was saying, because it seems to me that the things that we need to be thinking about in the early grades so that we can figure them out as we move to the more segmented and content-based approach of reading to learn as opposed to learning to read is how do you introduce the notion of a spiral-based curriculum where you continually go back and forth between the reading to learn and the learning to read 
And then my other question related to it is, how do you then scaffold the reading and writing? So very complex. <laughs> right. I'm, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll answer brain. that fully today, but we'll give it a try. Good questions, Joni. Others, other thoughts? Because I'm not going to do another round. Yeah, we'll do Peggy and then Linda. Do him. Who's him? Oh, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, no, quickly, as long as you brought up the sort of radical proposal, I was struck by some of the things in the in the patients' presentation there that, that um, for example, I, the, the term maybe child labor may be slightly unhelpful in cases where, in fact, yeah, many kids that age are having to do work that is essential mm -hmm. to the, the home, the, their domestic economy. It is, in fact, developmentally appropriate they can take pride in doing it. It's a good learning experience for the future that they have ahead of them. And that if the school is too rigid for them to be able to do that, then so much the worse for the school, not for their sociocultural milieu. Um, another thought about that, um, the, if you're looking at the developmental stage of, of kids that age, I think it, having taught in upper primary, both in several African countries in Canada, um, they're often not prepubescent, but fully pubescent. Often. So I was a little bit surprised that no, I don't think anyone mentioned like reproductive health content, not to have to pile more content in, but I think that's a pretty important one, especially for gender equity issues. Um, yeah, but the, the great big, observations. Yeah, the big, the big thing I want to mention was that um, uh, in connection with yeah, what the last two people who intervened were talking about, the, you mentioned the assessment, high stakes assessment for finishing primary school, which would give you accessibility to middle school. Um, we see the international development paradigm of assessment on early grade reading as being a fairly you know, narrow focus on this decoding. Um, and then now we have the SDG um, in position of this idea of basic competencies at the end of grade six, mm -hmm. which clearly will be a fairly narrow sort of focus. So all of those pressures kind of coming together it seems to be pretty strongly pulling against this very rich, critical thinking. And so that if, you know, it, to get, for that to get traction is going to need a kind of a total different assessment paradigm to go along with it, mm -hmm. to prove that there's outcomes for those kids that are somehow extremely helpful uh, beyond um, what, is, what, can be, what is being measured sort of in all those other ways. So. Yeah, no, fantastic comments. So we'll take Peggy's, but on the rigidity of school and sort of this issue of maybe we can't make school work for everybody, maybe we have to have alternative formats, maybe there has to be some delivery system that takes into account the kids that have to walk 10 kilometers a day at this age. I don't know, but um, you know, maybe Dr. Lydia, you could speak a little bit on that or patience when we get to it. Um, and on this richness and measurement, you know, how much do we narrow down and teach to the test? These are all the things we go through in every country, but how much do we teach to the test that UIS will use as a norm and how much do we try to stay learner-centered and spiraling and cyclical and let you work at your own pace, sort of a la madrasa, Edward. <laughs> um, I don't know, anyone on the panel can take that. And then sex ed, we should do better everywhere, including the United States, it turns out. And Peggy, your question. <laughs> so it's, I feel like I could talk to these guys afterwards, but uh, my name is Peggy and I work at RTI. So this question is probably for Lori or maybe for somebody from World Vision, but you know, Many of the things you're doing sound uh, exciting, and teachers probably enjoy doing them. Um, and I, but for behavior change, so I'm interested to know at what level your <laughs> teachers that were within the schools you were working with were building on things that they were already doing, or maybe there was examples either in ECD happening or in the upper primaries to say. Uh, these folks are already doing this, or you're doing this, but let's tweak it. So just sort of, as opposed to coming at it from a deficit approach of teachers are doing everything wrong, but let's get more of you to do what somebody else is doing. So I just wonder how that fits into your process. Great. So we'll hear about those from maybe South Africa and Rwanda. So back to Karen's question. Maybe, Lori, you could start with that, sort of this reading across the curriculum, and yet things tend to be very siloed. 
I don't know actually South Africa very well, so I don't know what that experience was, yeah, but in many countries that's, yeah, that's a reality. Thank you for the question. I can't speak uh, for South Africa in general because every um, region is somewhat different, and the Ministry of Education in the, in the Eastern Cape where we work is, is different than other places. Um, I'm advocating for not siloing the curriculum. I mean, that, I mean I'm, I'm presenting some pretty high-level reach-to-the-sky ideas that I think are problematic and we need to unpack them because it's hard to sustain the ideas that I'm bringing forth. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. Do we need to reach for those because we're talking about middle, upper, middle grade students going into secondary? You know, what our, alter, our, our ultimate goal is to create students who are citizens, who are, who are literate, who want to complete their secondary education and move forward. And so, um, I think I'm not sure how to exactly answer your question in terms of how do we fit this in the curriculum. What we have done in terms of talking to teachers is we talk about what's expected in the CAPS, right? What are some, what are the social learning components? And we look at those in terms of how can we create themes and ideas around those. Always bringing into this idea of how can we bring in students' life experiences, often completely ignored in the curriculum. And, and I think that we can ignore that for a little while. When we get to these upper primary grade students, they want to know what stake in the game do I have? Why should I learn this? Right? Talking about pre-adolescence, right? And the issues around um, identity, who I am, why I'm here, and why should I even persist when it's so difficult? And so what I'm proposing are these inquiry-based ideas with a spiral curriculum, which is challenging, right? Which is talking about teachers and Ministry of Education and colleagues coming together and negotiating a curriculum that is so rigid and saying it's not about just this rigid curriculum. It's about making that curriculum work for the students who are at risk of failing and dropping out. And so I don't have some answers for you. I wish I could tell you exactly how to do it, but I do think we should reach for the sky, um, and I do think that this grade level is extremely important to focus on. So thank you. Thanks. And maybe we can, oh, maybe we can go ahead. I know Karen is thinking, well, if USAID would pay me to do it, I could do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, maybe we can go ahead and move into the space around um, the Joni's question around how do you spiral reading and writing together, and what would that mean for reaching for the sky? And I think that came from um, Patience's presentation, right? The spiraling. Maybe you could speak right. to that. Uh, the, the spiraling was more, Laurie. Oh, sorry. Uh, I talked about spiraling for math. Yeah. And they do do it for math. If you look at the math textbooks even, they may not be the richest, they may not be the best, but there is that spiral right through where kids are learning fractions in third grade and in fourth grade and in fifth grade. So that, that's there. How it's taught would be um, completely different. But I think um, it... Like Lori, there are no simple answers. If there were, we all wouldn't be here, really. But I do think that here in the US, there used to be a saying, every teacher, a literacy teacher. And I think when it gets to um, teachers in the uh, upper primary grades, that has to be a conscious part of what they do, that they're not only there to teach math, they're not only there to teach science, but that they need to work with children to also improve their language proficiency. And so that means that they will be writing, whether it's word problems in math or learning how to write, um, I guess, a hypothesis in math. In, but that everything they do, that there is an integration of all four skills. They're going to talk about it, they're going to read about it, and they're going to write about it. Starting very simply, um, Laurie had sentence frames, for example, and starting that way. So those are just a few thoughts on that. I don't know if I've quite answered your question. But just making sure intentionally. And again, this is an issue because if they don't have a lot of time, well, there are things that are going to be skipped. But that I be firmly believe that children should write every single day, even if it's just walking up to the board because they don't have a notebook. 
I mean, I can certainly say, and we all lived this together, that writing, expressive writing was something that had to sort of come off the table in some of the reading priorities that we were trying to move forward with the programs that were funded from agencies like my own. Um, and that's not because any of us lacked a belief in the importance of instruction in expressive writing. But it did become the part of the ideal that wasn't, a wasn't attainable in five years. <laughs> Um, we couldn't we couldn't make that shift. So if the world is ready to go in that direction, let's give it another try. Um, there's lots of room to play in that space. Uh, okay, let's get to Daniel. Bonnie was oh, sorry. Okay, maybe a minute for Bonnie and then Daniel's question. Okay, just just briefly, one of the things that I'd like to share with you is that the research that I've done on on reading and writing is that what you're trying to develop in the child is not only the, the ability to obviously to, to learn to read and also to learn to write, and I think phonics is certainly helpful in that regard, but you also want children to develop the identity, I am a reader or I am a writer. Because if they develop the identity, I am a reader, um, they will take more risk. They develop a sense of ownership over the text they will navigate the text uh, more creatively. And that is also the, true for the construct, I am a writer. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just put it out there because issues of identity have been raised in the panel. And I've certainly found that in my own research that this has been central in breaking through to reading and writing for older children. Mm -hmm. It's and I'd also point. like to add that very often um, we talk about reading to learn and learning to read. And I, I, I don't think that we should make that dichotomy, really. I, I think that children in the early grades should be reading informational texts and should be learning through that. And, this should, and, and we've all known from your presentation, but from research, that we get to upper primary and children are still struggling um, in terms of decoding. So I, I think we might want to move away a little from that dichotomy. I think that's a great observation um, because, you know, we know, for example, that nonfiction in the early grades really does support a lot of what we might want to see in upper primary. So that's a good, good point. Um, let's quickly touch on this idea of maybe school is too rigid for some of these children. And if what we're trying to build is a world where every child has access to a quality upper primary education, is there a time when we don't think inside the box of the standard formal school system? And I, I know I said that. Um, I, we, we, we've already started in low and middle income countries, we've already started moving that way. So now you have double shift, don't you? If there are too many kids, you have a double shift. So the children who are coming in the morning for school and then the children who are coming after in the afternoon. And so just ways of working with ministries of education to say, maybe we shouldn't start too early. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have three shifts. And, and again, I, don't, I remember going to Kenya and saying, well, they could do professional development after school. And they were like, not in the rural areas because of wild animals. And I said, wild animals? Yeah. You know, <laughs> rustlers and so on. So all of these things have to be taken into account. But I, I do think we can, whether it's starting school later. So so if you have to fetch water, it's okay to get to school at nine instead of, and that there's room for you to learn that right. way. Um, and I'm, I would certainly put in just the comment that AID's current rhetoric is a lot around contextualizing your plan for a place. So, you know, maybe in working in upper primary, really understanding all the push-pull factors in that context on upper primary could help to make that kind of decision about what sort of alternative support to provide. Are there teachers who could be in classrooms who could receive these kids? You right. know, are there enough to work with them if they get in at 11? Right. And, and so really quickly, Alicia, because we're going to... Okay, maybe... Maybe we can go to uh, Lydia, and then we'll come back, because Alicia, we're going to need you to come in on Rwanda with the Rwanda and South African question about is there a way to use appreciative inquiry. Okay, I want to comment about rigidity in terms of especially instructional methods that we use, the pedagogical strategies that we use in our classrooms. We know that, for example, code switching has been used in many multilingual settings, but it is not taken up even as a topic in teacher in uh, mm -hmm. workshops or, uh, to prepare teachers to use them. And so 
that needs to be taken up mm -hmm. um, because you're using it and our administrators think that this is not right. But you know that's the only way to allow students to access what you are teaching, especially in content areas. Mm -hmm. So why not take this that up in teacher training, in uh, professional, develop, professional development workshops to make sure that that happens actually strategically, planned for, intentional, mm -hmm. rather than just something you just take when you need it at a particular moment. And that's a nice bridge because we know from research you've presented that it's already happening, so why not work with it instead of be rigid and fight against it, which could lead to Peggy's question, what can we take from Rwanda and South Africa in those examples where we were actually capitalizing on what teachers brought to the equation? I just wanted to, is it Dan, right? Is, I Daniel? want to just like look at that question a little bit. And that's Chris, Daniel from EDC, was, for those Daniel's who don't know. EDC, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think Christy's going to um, talk about Peggy. Question. But the, on the community piece, again, I think um, what's useful maybe is also if we you know, look at what are, there are a lot of resources in the community and we work with a lot of volunteers sometimes. And again, it's looking outside of that, that the, the formal school space and um, whether it's you talked about, you know, reproductive health or sex education or that we do a lot of work with um, just peer to peer education. And what are some of those approaches where um, whether it's volunteers um, and, and when we're working with adolescent girls. Um, there's a lot of work, I think, just to um, do in the communities where um, volunteers and adults um, can support the, some of those other areas. Great. And I think, Peggy, your question was around deficits, right? Well, just working with what teachers are already doing. Yeah, to yeah. New yeah, so I mean, I think... Um, I think when we went in and did the, the rapid assessment, we were kind of going in with a lens of what, what are the gaps. I think maybe that that could have been done better. Mm. Um, so that's a good point. Um, I do think when we went in, for an example, I'll give you a quick anecdote. We, we were in like a fifth grade classroom. They were doing a reading lesson on different types of animals, omnivore, herbivore, carnivore. And they'd made a list of the different types of animals on the board. So that was done very well. But then when it came to the exercise at the end, there was very little guided practice. The teacher erased all the words. And then the, te the kids had to go in and try to fill in their workbooks. But all their supports had vanished. So that gap was really that guided practice and that communicating that these teachers, it's okay to help these students when it comes to these exercises. They need those supports. We want them to be successful. This isn't a test, right? So kind of that within the toolkit, trying to frame it around that, some of those gaps we saw. Um, but also they were doing great during the lesson. It was just that gap towards the end. So trying to isolate. Did you want to nope. have any? I'm wondering from South Africa, any things that you saw the teachers doing that you thought, oh, I can really run with this. This is a great starting point. Um, yeah, let me think. <laughs> um, there, there, were, there were a lot, but it, but it took some critical, I guess it took, it took me and my colleague uh, opportunities to step back and say what, because you, you, it's easy to focus on what they're not doing. Um, our, uh, the teachers we were working with were very oral driven and focused on oral stories and morals and st telling students stories around um, topics, as, you, as I think is fairly typical. Uh, we talked about how could we turn that into opportunities where students become the storytellers. Mm -hmm. So just literally create, saying, let's, let's section off your class. Let's make five groups of students. Let's have a group over here. And kind of encouraging the teachers to let go of control and say, let's, let's name a, a child in each group to be the teacher. And, and that was just somewhat slight. But what it did is it allowed the collaboration, right? It allowed the students to then become experts. You saw the engagement way more than you saw when the teacher stood up in the front of the classroom. So I think I could probably come up with a lot more examples, but right now that's one that just pops in my mind. That's great. And I think we can all take that and remember that it is possible to sort of do that appreciative inquiry spin on this and say, okay, what am I finding that's really useful that, that I can build on? So with that, I think we're out of time. I need to thank our panel for getting us started in our upper primary discussion. So yay, flowers. <laughs>